Hello, uh, thank you for joining us from wherever you're watching. My name's Lee Boucher, I'm a historian at Macquarie University, and I'm here hosting um, this National Library of Australia digital event. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that I'm making this recording on the traditional lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, um, in the place that we now, of course, call Sydney. I'm here today to have a conversation with uh, Associate Professor Anna Clark, who is an ARC Future Fellow at the University of Technology, Sydney. I should also confess that Anna and I did our PhDs together many years ago at the University of Melbourne. Um, we'll try not to slip back into that kind of mode today when we talk to you. Anna's been researching and publishing in Australian history for 15 years or so, and much of her work, I think you'd say, has focused on representations and articulations of Australian history in all kinds of different sites, whether that's in schools, museums, newspapers, or by politicians. Um, she's currently working on an incredibly exciting project, um, which is a history of history making or history writing on this continent, um, what those of us in the history business would probably call historiography. Um, but I'm here with Anna today to talk about something quite different. I'm here with Anna to explore the history of fishing in Australia. Originally, we would, be, we would have been having this discussion at the National Library, because Anna has curated an exhibition for the NLA galleries, but because the NLA is currently closed because of COVID, we have transformed our original plans into this NLA digital event. Fortunately, we have some fabulous images from the exhibition to rouse your interest in coming to see it once the NLA reopens. And of course, Anna has written an incredible book, which I just conveniently have here, also titled <laughs> The Catch, which is published by NLA, which you could all order online after you finished watching and listening to us today. Um, so welcome, Anna. Hi, Lee. Thank you for having me. And I'd also like to acknowledge that I'm here, coming here from the um, Yuan country, and I'd like to acknowledge Elders past, present and future of the country in which my half of this remote conversation is taking place. And of course, COVID's made us all much more conscious of these Indigenous geographies, I think, because we're recording and meeting from different places and, and kind of that's becoming more apparent to us, ironically, as we're online. Um, but my opening, I guess, I, my opening thought, or opening question, and I, as your friend and colleague, I've had this thought a few times over the past couple of years, which is how on earth did you come to write a book and then curate an exhibition about fishing? Yeah, it's, um, I guess I, my day job is um, as a, you know, very serious historian, as you outlined in that generous introduction, I'm interested in how history is taught in schools, um, how it's debated in parliament and in the media pages. Um, but I moonlight as a very avid uh, aficionado, if you like, of fishing. Um, I'm obsessed with fishing. I dream about fishing. I spend all of my leave allocations going fishing and when the opportunity arose um, the head of NLA publishing Susan Hall contacted a, a, a sort of a, a compatriot of mine and asked did she know any historians who liked fishing um, my name sprang to mind and I reckon I ran as fast as I could to answer my email and say yes please pick me pick me uh, so a happy convergence of history making and fishing came together with these two projects. So I'm very lucky. That's really interesting. I wonder, hopefully maybe we can come back to this later, but I'd be interested to see if your own research made you rethink your own kind of experience and practice as a fisher person. Um, which brings me to that, that word actually, which is when we think about people who fish, we usually think about fishermen. Um, I, think, mm -hmm. I think our common understandings of fishing would be that it's something usually or predominantly or dominated by men rather than women. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, mm -hmm. um, I don't imagine that the NLA, when they thought up the project, um, they, might, they might not have assumed it was going to be a man, but I think we, we, in common cultural terms, that probably was a pretty safe assumption. Um, when you're researching this, this history of fishing in Australia, did you come across many other women who were fisher people? Um, and do you come across them in your daily fishing practice now? Yes, it's, it's strange, isn't it? The kind of, um, the language of fishing is absolutely masculine. And my own fishing trajectory was taught to me by my granddad and my dad and my uncles. So it's definitely gendered, but at the same time, 
all throughout history, fishing has absolutely been done by women. And even today, 30% of recreational fishers are women. And yet when you open a fishing magazine, it's all by men. Like I actually have not seen an article by a woman in a fishing magazine. Um, so I think it's a strange sort of disconnect. Then when we go back even further in time, as we'll see in some of the images that we're gonna look at, um, Aboriginal women, for example, were absolutely um, importantly embedded in fishing practices. And research today shows that uh, up to 90% of Indigenous women fish as well. So it's totally across uh, men and women and uh, generations, but the sort of, maybe it's the, the voice, the loudest voice gets heard or something. I don't know, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, because when we think about people who speak on behalf of fishers, um, whether that's professional or recreational, which I think is an important difference that your book explores. Um, when we think about, think about fishing celebrities or people who are known for fishing or people who speak, speak on behalf of the industry, that is almost routinely men. Um, yeah. Were they, were those, you know, as you wrote this book, I assume you came into contact with um, those communities or those figures or those people. What, have other people been surprised to find a woman taking control, if you like, of the history of fishing in Australia? Um, I guess so. Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. People do, are sort of surprised that a woman is fronting this. But um, strangely, I actually couldn't find any history written about Australian fishing, as far as I but can tell. There have been little bits and pieces. There's been a terrific history of angling by a guy, so that's just recreational fishing, by a guy called um, Bob Dunn about um, 20 or 30 years ago. And there are obviously local books and so on, um, but nothing that I could see. So maybe fishers aren't out there writing about history, they're sort of fishing. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> it's so funny, it's strange for such a popular activity, there hasn't been a lot written about its history. Um, that's, so you are, of course, doing the thing at university and we're both employed by universities um, and have to fill out reviews at the end of every year. Um, saying that you've written the first ever history of fishing in Australia is quite a nice thing to put on your CV, I think. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think it's getting me um, university points. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's getting you points from me. Um, oh, and I, I just... I, uh, I think I might like to move on to talk about one of the images from the, from the exhibition itself that's also in the book. Um, it's a really important image in the opening chapters of your book, I think. I think you, um, like many histories, general Australian histories now, um, uh, you begin by not with the moment of British settlement on this continent, but of course, by discussing and exploring um, Indigenous fishing practices, which I think, you know, um, I certainly learn a lot reading through the book about the, both the centrality and diversity of those practices across the continent. Um, maybe you could tell us a little bit, obviously the images that we have come from British colonists um, when, they, when they encounter Indigenous, in this case, fisher women. Um, and maybe you could tell me a little bit about this image. When did, when did you first come across it and what really struck you about it? Yeah, thank you. This is a, a beautiful image um, that's in a book by John Heaverside Clark about the sort of sports in Australia um, that he comes across in the early 19th century and is published in, in 1813, as you can see. It actually depicts, um, I think, a man and a woman. So the woman is holding... The, the canoe, the Naui canoe, steady. And I say, I think it's a man who has, who's holding a spear because um, spear fishing was a man's occupation, chiefly. Uh, women tended to do line fishing. And I think in the canoe behind, in the background, that's um, a, an image of a woman hand lining for fish. So that's what women tended to do. Um, I find this, like you sort of intimated there, Lee, it's such a, an interesting image because of course it's done through this sort of lens of colonization um, and you have to be wary of these colonial artifacts because they're getting us to a point 
of understanding, but, you know, what are they seeing? They're sort of watching this scene unfold with their own cultural baggage, I suppose, in mind. But at the same time, it's, it's hard not to be grateful for this kind of incredible image that it captures. So it's both colonial, but it's also really intimate and informative and helps people like us who are interested in looking at the genealogies of fishing go back over time and see what's taking place. I love the composition here, um, but also the, I guess in terms of image analysis, which I don't do very well at all, so bear with me. I love the, the sort of the stillness, but also it's obviously mid action. Um, so it feels very sort of um, quiet and peaceful, but you know, there's an Aboriginal man with his head under the water poised to strike a fish. And that gives us another indication, which I think is very important, is how much fish there was in those days, that that was a feasible way of catching it, because that's simply not imaginable today, I think. It's interesting you've mentioned kind of, um, and that's my association with fishing in the limited ways that I've done it. Like you, I was taught to fish by my father, um, although I didn't really take to it. Uh, but like, like that image and the way that you describe it, that's my kind of, I guess, memory of fishing, which is as a simultaneous poised for action, but also in kind of quiet solitude at the same time, mm. which I think, mm -hmm. you know, I wonder if partly the resonance of an image like this is that it does capture what is the experience of fishing, I think, for many recreational fishers, which is simultaneously quietude, perhaps companionship with one or two other people, but also yes. um, a spectre of excitement always looming around the corner. There's a kind of interesting... Action. Yeah, there's a kind of yeah. interesting narrative or story to the fishing experience that's captured, I think, beautifully yes. in that image. And one of the lovely things about doing this research and look at finding these sorts of images is thinking about those feelings of quiet solitude and contemplation and the mindfulness of fishing, as well as the kind of action and the excitement and the allure of fishing and seeing how, if not those exact feelings, but something very similar is happening over a very long period of time and that um, the past, you know, might not just be a foreign country, but there are these kind of tendrils that link fishing people or fishers over time through those feelings, which mm. kind of um, are perhaps partly instinctive as well. I'm not sure. Yeah, I was struck reading the book and I've, I read a little parts of it when it was in when it was being formed um but it was a great pleasure. thankfully i'm very <laughs> grateful for that <laughs> um but it, it was also a great pleasure to read the whole text kind of as a single work and in particular the and i just found a beautiful job of reproducing an incredible amount of images including some of you fishing which is just fabulous um <laughs> uh but um reading that book i was struck by and, and I think gurgling around the edges of, of your analysis and your history, um, mostly in the way that you write and the way you talk about fishing rather than necessarily what you're talking about. It seems to be a kind of history of feelings and spaces, a, a history of the way people have engaged with their surroundings and how they've felt about it, which is quite a different way to write a history if you think about the normal ways that people come to historical yes. knowledge that, yes. that you you yes. kind of putting putting physical space and our feelings about it at the center of the story that's so interesting i actually when i took on this job i just you know blindly said yes me please pick me um but when i sat down to try and write it i actually didn't know how to start and i didn't know what my in was and i didn't know how i could tell that story and I kind of really mulled about it um, over it for a long time and eventually I realised as I was reading and reading and reading, particularly the early accounts, um, the sort of colonial accounts and the explorers journals for example, I realised that I had been to most of these places. So I have travelled around Australia, literally driving around Australia fishing um, so I could imagine, reimagine the places that they were writing about. But also I realised that being uh, a keen fisher, I could imagine those feelings exactly as you said. And so I I'm glad you 
think that it's compelling. Um, but I thought that one way of getting into that history was actually through place and through feeling, um, mm. because I, that was the way that I could do it authentically. And and you're right, it's very hard in a, a history of a practice to do it just through the archives. You know, it's yeah. actually because it's a done, and um, it would have been quite a different book if it had just been um imagined on paper if you like rather than imagined mm. by doing or you know imagined by locating yeah and i think also you know while it might be difficult for us to speculate about the feelings of those indigenous fishermen and fisherwomen in that image i wonder if you got a sense of the kind of feelings that early colonists because this is where your book you know, then takes us from Indigenous fishing to the kind of encounter of colonisation and settlement. Um, did you get a sense of, you know, in your research and through these images, um, I guess, how colonists were apprehending the kind of watered worlds that they were encountering? How did they see um, the land they were encountering? How did they, did they, what kind of fishing practices did they bring? How useful yep. were they? Yeah. Um, well, on the in the holds of the first fleet, they brought fishing lines and fishing nets. So they knew mm. what they would be doing. Um, and they knew that there were fish here. I think they're early, the, the prevailing um, sense you get from these very early texts is both an extraordinary natural bounty, um, you know, great hauls of fish from Botany Bay and from Sydney Harbour and from some of those explorers who went inland in New South Wales in the early 19th century, like um, Oxley and and so on. Um, you know, rivers that were just filled with fish. And when they sat down in the evening to drop a line in, they were hauling up 15 kilogram Murray cod, you know, 30 of them in an hour kind of thing. Um, but at the same time, there's a sort of a, a, a paradox that, that it's not, you know, they're not really sure about how how rich it is, you know, it seems to be kind of a bountiful, but it's also slightly fragile and slightly unpredictable. So they might be walking in a drought filled landscape, but the rivers are full of, full of fish or they fish all summer and, you know, fill their nets in Sydney Harbour, but then in winter, the fish disappear. And so I was struck doing the research by this sort of the unknownness of the Australian landscape in comparison to sort of those webs, intricate webs of knowledge of Indigenous people who mm. could have relate the flying patterns of rainbow lorikeets with the numbers of ludric that would be in the shores, or when the prawns are running, the mullet would be this point in the, you know, uh, or whether the water was flowering, what would be happening in this particular estuary. So there's a, um, I guess there's a kind of a surprise that comes with with um, the amount and the diversity, natural diversity in Australia, but also a tentativeness, um, which is which is realised quite early on that there's a kind of a tipping point and that there is a fragility to this bounty. And also, I think you know a lot of historians talk about terms like being unsettled. Um, mm. You know, this a kind of people unset, uh, excited but unsettled at the same time, and I think mm. you know that that's kind of what you're, you know, yeah. that, and that's that what you're describing here. Yeah, and that also explains, I think, um, that powerful colonial urge, not by all, but by some, for a very strong acclimatization movement mm. because it didn't feel right. You know, the fish were different; they didn't bite the same. They didn't. The rivers are full of fish, but they're the wrong fish. They're not trout. Um, so there's this sort of quite powerful urge to uh, relocate and recreate a kind of fishing of the old world in the new um, as a way of perhaps overcoming that feeling of being unsettled. So across the 19th century, um, and I am, of course, now revealing that I'm struggling to remember this section of the book, but across the 19th century, um, I would have assumed that the colonists, you know, when confronted with bounty and abundance, um, would of course um, be excited, that, that would sustain many colonists, you know, that's, that's kind of food source. Um, is there, what kind of, how do they encounter native species? Obviously, you know, is the move to acclimatisation simply, you know, to acclimatise um, European species to Australian waters? 
is that simply a mood uh, a move to make themselves at home or is that because they don't like the taste of Australian native fish both really um, they want they want to feel more at home um, but also because they think Australian some of them think that Australian fish are rubbish um, and but, but, but importantly within that acclimatization movement there's also a movement of acclimatizers who want to bring certain fish from one part of Australia to another. So there's also a sort of an economic um, desire in that as well, where fishing is a, a resource, a natural resource um, that should be exploited. And for some, that's a kind of a nostalgic enterprise, mm. bringing the you know the fish of the old world. But for others, it's purely um, you know how do we maximise the natural resource of Australia? How do we extract everything for as long as we can? Um, but very soon that starts to look a little more iffy, you know, by the 1870s, the oyster reefs around Sydney have been completely decimated. Um, and there's an understanding that can you, can, you know, maybe you can't just go around the next corner and flog the next piece of, of waterway and governments start getting involved um, by introducing legislation to try and protect and have fisheries that are sustainable. And that this sort of give and take and balance, which is still, you know, creates lots of political tension, uh, starts very early on. And partly as in response to Australia's natural world, they just thought, let's just, you know, go for gold, there's heaps here. Um, but sure enough, they realised that heaps is a pretty relative term. Yeah, I was, I was struck by the kind of repeating story that occurs through the book of um, species being fished out and mm. that this dynamic of species being fished out and then um, emerging, I guess, industries or professions or professional fishers having to move and adapt because, in fact, they'd exhausted this natural resource. Mm. It did seem it's like, like on, the one, yeah, on the one hand, you could say, you know, this is, an, this is a tension that's there from the start, but it doesn't seem to me like... Um, settlers and then, you know, kind of post-Federation Austra white Australians really learnt much about that. For, it took a while for mm. um, fishing practices to kind of change in, res in response to this um, repeated pattern of abundance and exhaustion, abundance and mm. exhaustion, abundance and exhaustion. I guess because um, until there was no more abundance, there was always the next abundance that mm. you could exhaust. So that question of sustainability took a long time to catch up. Um, and also I think the science took a long time to catch up. I was, there's something really powerful about the idea of a resource that you can't see, like you can't mm. actually count the fish really. Um, it's not like looking at a crop, you know, you can see a good year or a bad year, uh, but you don't really know that with the underwater world. And I think that takes a long time for the science of fisheries to sort of catch up with, uh, the anecdotal evidence that was happening in fishing communities around Australia of extraction and then a, then a tipping point. Um, but it, it's a sort of a very l long and slow burn. And it's also got lots of different um, stakeholders, although I'm loath to use that word. Uh, you know, the, the government is trying to push expansion and actually funding the buying of fishing trawlers in the 20th century. Um, the CSIRO is encouraging, you know, canning and different industries. So there's this, it's, it's not um, simply that fishers are going off to, you know, um, make, make a buck. It's also this sort of sense of nation building and extracting as much as you can from everywhere. And I think that a lot of primary industry, industrial production in Australia has that same mentality for a long time, which is very different from the uh, traditional owners that were usurped. So maybe we could move on to discuss, actually that's a perfect kind of segue um, into another it's image. <laughs> um, another image from the exhibition and from the book itself. Um, uh, this is an image, um, if we'll pull it up onto our screen now, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, uh, and I'm going to say a sentence that makes me sound like I have knowledge and expertise that I don't. And it's simply because I'm reading how the image is described, that it's a 90 pound Maury Cod. Um, yes. um, but this, in this case, being caught by a professional fisherman, right? So 
you know, that, that story of abundance and exhaustion seems to be kind of entangled with um, kind of professional or industrial, or I'm not quite sure what the word, right term here is, but um, uh, fishing to sell as opposed to fishing simply to eat. Um, yes. Uh, so how soon into the kind of history of settlement on this continent does that kind of, you know, um, amped up scale start to start to occur? Very early on, uh, surprisingly, by the late 19th century, fisheries were deemed kind of empty around Sydney mm. Harbour, for example, and um, and even in sort of shores. And people are sort of saying, we can't go out and catch a feed in Sydney Harbour anymore because the netters have been netting and they're, all the fish are gone. And that's happening by the sort of 1880s. Uh, and royal commissions are being... Um, uh, instigated by governments, state governments around the country about how do we sort of preserve fisheries and how do we legislate for them. Uh, this is an incredible example of an image. Um, uh, in the late 19th century and up in the 20th century, inland waterways were, as I said, you know, really filled with these incredible natural fisheries. I just read this morning that it's estimated that in New South Wales alone, they've lost up to 90% of the species in inland waterways since um, colonisation. And this says it all really, doesn't it? Uh, mm. This would have been an enormous breeder if you think of the size of fish being allowed to be kept. Um, it would have been the kind of one of those motherships cruising the rivers. And um, it, you know, that it was really, very unregulated for a long time um, until it was almost too late. And now it's a very precarious fishery. Um, there is no commercial fishing allowed anymore uh, of Murray Cod in New South Wales. The fishery closed and the government um, forced it to be closed precisely for this reason, um, because it, it got too far and there was no kind of coming back. I must confess I was surprised and this is probably um, a result of the story that you're telling in the book, which is that I had, it, it never occurred to me that commercial fishing could be occurring in fresh water because it just mm. seems to me to be something that happens at sea. And I, of course, have an image of incredibly large boats and incredibly large nets somewhere far off the coast, but of course that's not how commercial fishing happens. But there obviously was commercial fishing of fresh water, which I don't believe is happening anymore anywhere like is that is that still that's not really happening now because of these fisheries being fished out yeah there there are small scale in certain parts you know in little um but it's very very highly managed now and mm. you, a lot of the commercial fishing fresh water is um actually aquaculture so it's right. uh trout farms and barramundi mm. farms and and that sort of thing which is very different uh, but, and is in response to the fact that this was uh, unsustainable and overfished for so long. Like a lot of those resources uh, all around Australia. Uh, ...was going to end... Um, maybe it's not up to me to end it. I'm going to wait for the government to, um, to end it. <laughs> um, you mentioned, you know, earlier on the kind of the knowledge of the individual fisher person to be able to read landscape, you know, mm -hmm. to be able to read ripples in a water to understand what might be happening underneath it. And I think, you, you know, that, that idea gestures towards, again, I think one of the, the characteristics of fishing or the intriguing characteristics of fishing, which is the kind of um, uh, the mystery of what's going on underneath the water and the various kinds of knowledges that, that fishers use to try and decode it. Um, fisher, other than fishers. Yes, fishers. <laughs> <laughs> um, and obviously commercial fishing relies on certain forms of technology and knowledge, I think. Um, mm. And we see a kind of, I guess, technologization of commercial fishing over the course of the 20th century, which means that these individual fishing knowledges of an individual person who can read water are mm. taken over by kind of 
you know, various instruments that will tell you where the fish are. Yep. Um, yeah, I was I just... just... Go on. You go. <laughs> oh, I, I was going to say, um, I think one of the interesting things about the 20th century is that mechanisation and industrialization and technologization of fishing, not just for commercial fishers, but also for recreational fishers. And the impact of recreational fishing can't be ignored. Um, you know, fish finders, sharpened hooks, internet chat forums, mm -hmm. they all contribute to uh, the sort of extraction of fishes from mm -hmm. our waterways. Um, but one of the interesting things, going back to your, the commercial fishing and the sort of technologization and industrialization of that, with government support largely, is that it still has that connection to place. And, um, you know, there's a sense of custodianship um, that comes with a lot of primary industries, I think. It's very interesting mm -hmm. about, you know, management and knowing a place and industries that are passed on from generation to generation of, you know, this my dad's secret reef out, you know, past Eden or um, so there's this change in technology and change in practice. Um, but when licenses are bought up, for example, and life, that life, the fishing life of a commercial fisherman or fishing family, I should say, um, changes and you know many of these licenses were bought by governments so fishing families stopped being fishing families the very profound sense of loss of connection to place and connection to practice which i think is the as sort of an interesting flip side to that um, you know there's commercialization and there's and there's industrialization but there's still this very important physical located um, embodied um, connection to fishing so that bring, might bring us to our third image, um, which is um, of uh, a tuna, tuna, tuna being fished, well, actually tuna being brought up. It is a kind of incredible <laughs> photograph, to be honest. Um, yeah. <laughs> probably one of the most arresting ones of, of the book. Yes. Uh, so this is tuna fishing just outside Eden. Um, yeah. Uh, is Eden a kind of... And, you know, one of the questions that I kind of had was, are there towns that become fishing villages or fishing towns over the course of the 20th century, kind of connected to this extraction of natural resources, but also really embedded, therefore, in their place and connected to it because there's so many, I guess, usually men, um, mm -hmm. who spend their lives in that place trying to understand how it works for extraction yeah. nonetheless, but nonetheless connected to it. Are there these kind of fishing communities? Yes. Absolutely. And and there have been even before they were um, uh, industrialised and commercialised. There are the, in the 19th century, before there's refrigeration, there are little fishing communities all around Australia. Some of them were Chinese and they were preserving fish through smoking or pickling wow. and they were feeding Chinese miners, you know, from... Victorian coast right up to the Northern Territory. There are huge uh, ch Chinese communities um, who, who are um, buying the fish from tiny little fishing families who might have moved up the coast, up and down following the fishes, you know, following the mullet run or following the salmon. Uh, in the late 19th century and in the early 20th century, there are fishing communities who are waiting eagerly for the train to come by so that they can get their fish to Sydney before it spoils because there's no ice. Um, or in the Great Depression, there are fishing communities who are escaping poverty in the slums in the cities to live in little shacks by the Royal National Park, for example, just south of Sydney or even around Perth in different little sort of shanty towns. Uh, and villages to fish. And they are also really in profound connections to place. They might not have chosen to be there otherwise, but the sort of realities of history mean that that's what they're there, that's what, why they're there, and, and they have these kind of really interesting connections. Um, to add to the Eden story, I think one of the powerful connections is not only um, that knowledge that of these families that pass on sort of fishing folklore and uh, and technique over time, but also the danger of it. You know, they give their lives. It's not um, it's not 
a white collar job. Um, it's a it's a really hard job and it's really dangerous and I think that also adds an element of connection to a place when someone dies mm. there and I think a lot of these families um, have these very powerful connections of, of weather events and ships going down and people losing their lives that tethers them to the fishing practices in a way that I think many of us might not understand um, yeah, otherwise. and also, and surely orients them to that the natural world or their their place yes. in very particular ways, which is yes. simultaneous deep affection and you know connection, but also risk. That that's absolutely a, that's a very interesting kind of uh, set of twins, yes. and we might say opposing orientations to place to to have it simultaneously as something that you risk your life by entering into every day. Um, but also that you feel deeply connected and knowledgeable about. That's, yeah. That strikes me as something, again, you know, I've been thinking, how do we understand fishing? Like, what is particular and peculiar about it? Um, and that seems to me one of the particularities and peculiarities of, of particularly ocean fishing, which I, it strikes mm. me, I think, is much riskier, you know, and there's mm. lots of yes. stories in the book of people being swept off rocks and, and yes. all kind of out to sea in danger. Yeah, and it still happens. <laughs> yeah. Um, look, I'm aware that, you know, this discussion was supposed to go for 20 minutes and we're already gone far, 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 <laughs> far, far, far beyond that. Much like Aren't they on silent? You know, <laughs> yeah. they're, 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 they're all mute, so we can just keep going. <laughs> for as long as we want. Look, to try and, <laughs> to try and perhaps wind up um, or at least come to, you know, come to some kind of conclusion, you know, you have written this history of fishing and produced this fabulous exhibition um, at the National Library, which, you know, creates a story. It, it, it crafts a narrative. It creates particular players and tensions. It encourages us to think about ourselves in this place and people who fish in particular kinds of ways. Um, that's what we do as historians. We create stories for people to, you know, orient themselves in the present. Um, and maybe even transform the way they think about their presence. Sometimes I think the job of a historian is to sort of unsettle us and make us tell our stories a little differently or um, open out different kinds of questions. So I was wondering, do you think, do you feel like you changed your orientation to fishing or did it do anything to you as a, you know, did writing this history change your, yes. change the way you understand your own fishing or tell stories about it? Absolutely. I'm now full of really, really irritating tidbits of information. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, like the one I'm about to tell you, which is um, uh, I'm currently staying at my grandparents' property on the south coast of New South Wales and there are Kurrajong trees here which weren't cleared and we've never known why they weren't cleared. It's a curious oversight so standing in the middle of the paddock as a Kurrajong tree and I've just been reading uh, Grace Carskin's beautiful history of early Sydney called The Colony mm -hmm. and she um, talks about the importance of Kurrajong trees in Aboriginal women um, creating fishing lines uh, and then I was reading a list of vocabulary from the Sydney region and Gurrajong means fishing line. So now when I walk through the paddocks of my grandparents farm I look at fishing line trees and that's their name. And yeah. that's kind of cool. I like to think of those ties and those, that place um, or walking past a midden on my way to fish. I can think of, wow, well, maybe they had that same thought that that looked like a likely spot, you know? Um, so it's, it's definitely increased my interest in fishing if that was ever possible, but it's also really made me beautifully aware of um, my history historical place in time that I'm doing something that people have done before me and people will keep doing in the future. Um, so it's more than simply tidbits and little facts and <laughs> annoying stories around the dinner table, although I have heard a few of those. Um, yeah, thanks. <laughs> but it's also, it's reoriented you in that practice to understand it as an historical one that might connect you to yes. other people, other stories other ways of being, other orientations to the landscape. Um, yeah. Is that what you're trying to do more broadly with this book, do you think? Is that, you know, are you hoping that 
you know, um, the person who reads the ang recreational angling magazine might pick mm. up your book or wander into the gallery and rethink or reimagine themselves or understand themselves as connected to kind of indigenous fisherwomen, fisherwomen from the late 18th century, which is a kind of unimaginable, unimaginable yes. connection, I think, for many kind of settler Australians today. Um, yes. Is that sort of the project in part of this book to kind of make people think about their connections and orientations differently? Absolutely, if that's possible, to draw a fishing line from your own brand new carbon fibre, $150 rod bought in Marimbula to an Eora woman sitting in her Nawi with a breastfeeding a little baby and dangling a garajong twine down to the fishes below. Um, it's hopelessly um, ahistorical and simplistic and crosses lots of cultural boundaries, but also maybe that act of thinking and that act of that sort of leap of imagination might kind of bring um, a more complicated understanding of Australian place as well as uh, what we do today and the practices of that, I hope. That's um, a beautiful place to end this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks very much, Anna. It's been a pleasure as always to talk to you. Thank you for those watching and listening, I hope. Um, for joining us in this National Library of Australia digital event. And don't forget, um, you can engage in much more detail with Anna's work in Let Me Just Become a Barrel Girl, this lovely book, which is available online from numerous booksellers. But also once the library reopens, you'll be able to go in and see some of these incredible images um, on the walls of the National Library of Australia. Thanks very much, Anna, and thanks for our visit.